so beautiful. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And thank you very much. They set a record. Now I understand why they have a record in this room. What a room. What a place. What a place. Iowa. Do we love it? Great. Great. You know, we had a big day today because a lot of polls came out. And the polls were really nothing short of tremendous. We had and it just came in New Hampshire, which is an amazing place with, like you, incredible people. They love the country, and they want to see our country be great again. That's what they want. They work hard. They love it. And we had 35 percent. And the second place was so far back, we won't even talk about it, because I want to be nice tonight. I want to be nice. In South Carolina, we had 30 percent, and that was a, a tremendous poll, tremendous energy, tremendous money spent, 30 percent, second place again. We're going to be so nice. Should we be nice or not? Should we be? Yeah. A little bit. A little bit. So we had 30 percent. That's the Monmouth poll, big one. Uh, the Gravis National Poll just came out, 40.1 percent. That's national, 40.1 percent. I want the election tomorrow. <laughs> Ann Coulter is here. Ann, can we call for an immediate election, please, okay? Like in so many other countries. I want an immediate election, Ann, all right? Go out by her book, by the way. It's actually a very good book. And oh, is it true. Now, very importantly for, for Iowa, Anybody ever heard of the corn kernel? Everybody heard. The corn kernel poll. We were at 36 percent, won very easily. And so we had four of them, and that came from the State Fair. And I'll tell you what, last week, I came to the State Fair. I came well-equipped in a helicopter. And we took the kids for rides. And those kids love me. Those kids, and I love those kids. But we had an amazing time. In fact, my pilot said, is that enough, Mr. Trump, after going up and down like a yo-yo? I said, nope. You got to keep doing it. So we had, we had an amazing time. But, you know, having gotten that vote, because I know it means a lot to the people here, and having gotten that vote is incredible. So here's what's happening. It's a little bit of a different situation, I think, maybe, than has happened before. A great journalist called me, somebody that I don't know, but somebody that I have great respect for, one of the major newspapers. And he said, could I ask you one question, Mr. Trump? What? How does it feel? I said, how's what feel? He said, this was the summer of Trump. Do you believe this? How good is that for my ego? Is that good? But they said, he said, I mean, and he's really one of the, now the press is going to say, who is it, who is it, who is it? But one of the really top people, not even necessarily a fan of mine, but I think he's becoming a fan rapidly. He said, how does it feel? So I said, why do you ask that question? Because it doesn't feel, I mean, I got to win. You know, it's one thing to have the summer of Trump. It doesn't mean anything unless we win both the nomination and we got to beat Hillary or whoever's running. Whoever is running. No, because otherwise it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. I don't know, does it, it doesn't, if you lose, like, what does it all matter? And he said, it doesn't matter if you win or not. What you've done has never been done. You know, nobody's seen what's happened here. Nobody's really seen this with the polls and the enthusiasm and the press and, and the ratings. And you know why those cameras are all red lighted? Because of ratings. If I didn't get ratings, they wouldn't be here. They wouldn't be here. They're not nice people. They don't care about me. They don't care about you. They don't care about anything. The only thing they care about is ratings. You know, when I did The Apprentice, which was a tremendous success, I was hosting Saturday Night Live, and Lorne Michaels came up to me, and it was Bedlam. It was Bedlam. The show was number one. It was doing like crazy, and here I am hosting Saturday Night Live. My mother and father would have never believed this. And Lorne Michaels comes up to me and said, this is great. I said, you know, Lorne, it won't always be like this. 
Someday the ratings won't be good, and NBC will call me, and they'll say, I'm sorry, Mr. Trump, but the ratings are no good. We're going to cancel the show. And he looked at me, and he said, I'll never forget it. He said, no, there's one thing wrong. They won't even bother to call. It's true. They won't even bother to call. And, you know, The Apprentice was a tremendous hit. NBC renewed it. I may be like the only one, or one of certainly like, you can count them on your hand, that turned down a major renewal. In fact, Mark Burnett said, you gotta be kidding. You gotta be kidding. You're turning down a major renewal. He called it a renewal. He said, you're turning down a renewal. Nobody turns it down. And I turned down a renewal for many, many shows. And you see the kind of money they paid me. Remember, you had that certain anchor that said he doesn't believe it, ba ba ba, and then he had to apologize. A lot of money. I turned down a lot of money because I told the heads of NBC, the head of Comcast, who's an amazing guy, great guy. We'll just call him Steve. But I want to tell you, he's a great guy. The head of NBC, the head of reality television. They came to my office like five months ago. They sat in my chairs. They said, Donald. We want, we've already renewed the apprentice. We want you. We love you. They don't love me so much anymore, I have to be honest. <laughs> and I said to him, fellas, I really want to run for president. I want to make America great again. It's very simple. I want to do it. <laughs> and, and they didn't believe me. They didn't believe me. And I said, honestly, I'm going to do it. And they had the upfronts. The upfronts is when they announce all the shows. And they said, we're announcing, we're renewing The Apprentice with Donald Trump. I said, I can't believe it. I told them, nobody believed me. And my wife actually said to me, she said, you know nobody believes you're running. Because I looked at it serious, mostly last time. But, you know, I looked at it, but very unseriously over the years. But last time I looked at it pretty seriously. And I said, what do you mean? She goes, if you ever actually announce, you're going to go through. She knows people like me. Actually, I'm a nice person. Nobody knows that. It's true. People don't. I tell people I'm a nice person. It, in some ways, it's not good, because now we're going to talk about China and negotiation. I don't want to be a nice person for that. But I am. I love people. I love helping people. And my wife said to me, Melania, she said, if you run, you're going to win. But you have to announce. Because if they take polls, nobody's going to say you're running. Right? And Ann knows that. And I said, well, I don't know. And I'll tell you what. It takes courage to run. It really does. You're really exposing yourself like crazy. <laughs> the press is, honestly, a lot of the press is, especially the political press. You know, the financial press has been pretty good to me over the years. Um, in Business Week magazine, they named me a while ago the best, in a people's poll, the best negotiator. Wouldn't it be nice to have a good negotiator? I don't want to brag about it. It's just what they, wouldn't it be nice? I mean, look at what's happening with China. I've been predicting China. I've been saying China's taking our jobs, our money, our base, our manufacturing. I just told the press. And we owe them. Think of it. They've taken our money on our jobs, our manufacturing. Our, they've taken everything. It's one of the greatest thefts in the history of the world, what they've taken out of our country. They've rebuilt China. And we owe them. Think of it. We owe them. They took everything. $1.4 trillion. How do you do that? That's like a magic act. How good are they as negotiators? They take everything, and we owe them money. We owe Japan 1.4 trillion, same number. We owe them both 1.4 trillion for whatever reason, same number. The balance, the deficits, the numbers are crazy. If you look at the deficit we have with Japan, the deficit we have with China, the deficit we have with almost everybody, honestly, they're abusers, they're big abusers. And, and by the way, I love them. They buy my apartments, it's true. I own a big chunk, the biggest chunk. I own, as you maybe know, the Bank of America. But a lot of people didn't know. Actually, most people didn't. I own the Bank of America building in San Francisco. Big, big, big chunk. And it's a great building. I got it from the Chinese. I did great. 
They still don't know what happened. But that's what we need, right? I own 1290, big, big chunk, 1290 Avenue of the Americas, many buildings in New York. But I do great with the Chinese. And they're great people. The problem is their leaders are too smart for our leaders. So it's very simple. I'm a free trader. I believe in free trade, right? I like free trade. I like free trade. But free trade's only good if you have smart representatives. It's not good if we have dummies. It's not good if our leaders are incompetent. It's not good when they've never read The Art of the Deal, one of the great books of all time. Second to the Bible, but that's okay. Way, way, way deep second. You know how far below it is? Somebody held up the book the other day. I said, that's my favorite book of all time. I said, no, 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 let me change it. It's my second favorite book. They said, what's your favorite? I said, the Bible. It's not even close. People were shocked. They were, they were shocked that I actually said that. But it is the greatest book of all time, the Bible. Nothing even close. So we have a situation where people that run for political office, and I've heard this for years, they do really take chances. And it is something that's not very pleasant. And you read things about yourself that don't exist, very little good, that does, but a lot of bad things that, that aren't true. And I have to tell you, with that, I've met some unbelievable, really talented political reporters. But I've also met some very bad ones and very dishonest ones. And we have to do something about our country. We have to take it back. You know, I've been using a term that hasn't been used in a long time. It's called the silent majority. You're the silent majority. I'm the silent majority. And they're tired of politicians other than, are there any politicians in the room? Because we're excluding you, you're fabulous, okay? But politicians are all talk and no action. That's true. They're tired. You know, I've been watching Bush on the border. He's in a seersucker suit. He's talking about, yes, oh yes. The anchor baby. Oh, I shouldn't say anchor baby. You know, he puts out a report saying, do not use the term anchor baby. Then I used it. My polls go through the roof. And now he's using anchor baby. And he's taking criticism. And you know, the funniest thing is that he's taking tremendous criticism for using the term anchor baby. And I use it all the time. And nobody cares what I say, because they sort of expect it from me, I think. You know? Right? Right? Crazy. Crazy. But politicians are all talk, no actions. And you know, I saw that a little bit at the debate. And I love doing the debate. I was treated very unfairly at that debate, to be honest with you. But that's okay. But, but it was fine, because I won every poll. Time Magazine, oh, we won the polls. I was, I was so happy. But, but I was treated. And then I watched the politicians. And the politicians talk. Now, I have heard that Jeb Bush was the mentor to Marco Rubio. Nice, two nice people. I think Jeb is a nice person. He's very low energy. I'm not used to that kind of a person. You know? <laughs> I'm just not used to it. I'm used to, you know, dealing with killers, people that go, ah, ah, ah. I mean, you know, negotiating with, with Japan negotiating with China. When these people walk in the room, they don't say, oh, hello, how's the weather? It's so beautiful outside. Isn't it lovely? How are the Yankees doing? Oh, they're doing wonderful. Great. They say, we want deal. <laughs> He'd jump out of the seat. But I watched, by the way, before I say this, who would you rather have negotiating against China, against Iran? What a deal that is, okay? You talk about incompetent people against anybody, Jeb Bush, Hillary Clinton, or Trump? I think so. I think so. You believe me. Believe me. So, thank you.
You know, it's funny. I was uh, graded on a speech that I made recently. They gave me all A's. They gave me these great grades. They said, the one mistake he makes is that he speaks through the applause. That's true. You know why? Because I don't have time. It's true. They gave me this great mark. They said, his speaking. They love the way I move my hands. I never even thought of it. They said, they love this, that. But, but they said, he, he speaks so well. But he speaks through his applause. And it's bad for him because he kills a lot of applause. And I thought about it, and I said, you know, that's right. And I tried not doing that, but I don't, I don't like, I want to get going. You know, I want to get things done. Does everybody here know that, right? You know? <laughs> so, Jeb Bush was Marco Rubio. And Marco Rubio's a nice guy. And so is Jeb Bush. I think he's a nice person. But I don't care. I don't care if he's nice. Because I want somebody that's going to make great deals and make us rich again. And he can't do it. <laughs> so, Marco Rubio was not supposed to run, right? Because he wouldn't run because his mentor in Florida, the state of Florida, which, by the way, I beat both of them in the polls. Can you believe it? A sitting senator, a governor, and Trump is way the hell up here. It's crazy. <laughs> but. But Marco Rubio wasn't supposed to run. All of a sudden, he announced he's running. And people thought it was very disrespectful to a person that brought him along. Slowly brought him along, right? Hi. So beautiful. So what happened, and it was interesting, I said, oh, now if it was me, if, if I were Bush, and I brought somebody along, and I, I'm older than Marco, and all of a sudden, the guy, the young guy that I brought along said, I'm running against you. And it's not my turn, but I don't care because I'm really anxious. I'm really driven. For myself, I'm driven. And he said, I'm running against him, and I don't care. I would really go after that guy. I'd say he's the most disloyal guy. He's a terrible person. He's horrible, and I hate him. OK? <laughs> I'd say that. Or at least I'd say it to myself, OK? Probably not to the, to the world, but I'd, uh, believe me, I wouldn't be. So I saw them on a stage recently. And Jeb said, oh, Marco's a dear friend of mine. He's a dear, dear friend. He's such a wonderful person. And Marco's saying, oh, I love Jeb. You notice Jeb never uses his last name? Why? Because he's ashamed of it. Why? But if I were Marco, but in particular, if I was Jeb, I wouldn't say Marco's a good friend of mine. Marco did something that he wasn't supposed to do. He ran. I've never said this before. And I watch these two guys, and they're hugging, and they're kissing, and they're holding each other. <laughs> very much like, actually, Chris Christie did with the president. <laughs> very much. No, I'm only kidding. No, but they're hugging and they're kissing. They're hugging and they're kissing, and they're, they're proclaiming their great deep love for each other. And I'm saying, politicians all talk, no action. It's all bull. we got to stop. We need people that are going to take us to the promised land. We need people that are going to be great. So again, we look at Mexico. Thank you. You look at Mexico, which is the new China. By the way, they're doing great. And what's come out, you know, a lot of incoming, as Rush Limbaugh said. He said, Trump has taken more incoming. When I first announced, all I did was tell the truth. But you look at Mexico, the new China. You look at Ford building a massive plant there. You look at other companies from Europe, from all over. A plant was going to be built in Tennessee, big, big, billion-dollar automobile plant. It's not being built in Tennessee anymore. It's going to go to Mexico. Nabisco, I have holdings in Chicago. I have a great building in Chicago. Nabisco. They have a factory, big factory. They make Oreos. I'm never eating Oreos again, ever. Ever. Eh, maybe. <laughs> maybe if I can find some made in the United States, I will. But they're closing their big plant in Chicago, and they're moving it to Mexico. What's going on? I mean, how stupid are we? You're right. So where and why are we doing this? Why are we allowing it to happen? So what I would do, if I were president, I'd talk to these people. Somebody has to talk to them. 
And if you don't talk to them, it's never going to change. It's never going to happen. And you can get them to stay in Chicago. You can get them to build someplace else in the country. You can get Ford, believe me, to stay in this country. Now, sometimes it's so unfair, the trade agreements. If you look at the amount of business that's been moved out of our, whether it's Mexico or many other countries, been moved out, it's absolutely uncontrollable by the people that we have currently. And we can do something to change. Now, let me just tell you, and I tell this all the time. I'd go to Nabisco or I'd go to Ford. I'd say, fellas, I don't want you. I don't want you. You know, I have Carl Icahn ready. Killer. Killer. I have other people ready. I have people that are so nasty, so mean, so horrible. Nobody in Iowa will want to have dinner with them. It's true. <laughs> They're horrible human beings. I admit it. They're Wall Street killers. Most of them. A couple of them are nice, like about 2%. But they're the greatest negotiators in the world. I know the best. I know the best. I know guys that are overrated. I know guys that are really good. I know people that you've never heard of that are better than all of them. We're going to use our best. But I would say to, let's say, the head of Ford, and you've heard me say this, because to me, that's a big abuse. Two and a half billion for a plant? You know how big that plant? How many plants do we close to build a new plant in Mexico? Two and a half billion dollars. You're right. So how many, how many do we do? So I would say, very simply, fellas, sorry, you got to move back. Now, when they build those cars, trucks, and parts, they send them over, no tax, no nothing, and they've come up with a new scheme. Illegals are going to drive the cars over because, no, it's true. It's true. It's true. Because, because, it just works so nicely. Nobody's going to check them. So why just drive beautiful cars? They'll probably keep them and just live happily for the rest of their lives in the United States, you know. But we have to do something about it. Now, let's say Jeb Bush is president. He knows it's wrong. He's not a stupid person. I don't think. I don't know. What do I know? But let's say he's president. And he knows it's wrong. He's going to say, no, 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 we don't want that. Ford. We don't want you to go, we're going to charge you a tax. Because, you know, the way you do it, you just say, charge a tax, right? And then he's going to be hit by his lobbyists. They gave him millions. You know, he's got $135, $40 million. I don't have anything. I don't want anything. I don't want money. I'm just taking little small contributions for people. They send, I mean, the woman sent $7 and like 32 cents. And I was so, look, with a beautiful letter. No, it's amazing. I like that, because that's like an investment. But. That adds up to the fuel for the plane for a trip to Iowa, okay? It all does. But who cares? I don't want that because I don't want to be controlled. Last week, you've heard me say this, I turned down $5 million by a big lobbyist. Not a bad person. You know, tough guy. Not a bad person. But when he gives me five, he's not doing that because he thinks I have beautiful hair. It's not that bad. And it is my hair. And is it my hair? It is. It is, actually. People don't know that. I proved that, you know, in Alabama, it was really hot and it was rainy, and I took off my hat, and everyone said, it really is his hair. It's weird. <laughs> I don't have to do that tonight. It's sort of nice. But, but you know, so we, we would go over, and the lobbyists would say, no, no, we gave you millions of dollars, Mr. President, and you owe it to Ford. Let them have what they want. So you got the lobbyists, you got the spec. They're going to say, and after about 10 minutes, he's going to say, oh, I can't really do that. They really helped me in my campaign. With me, they're going to call me because I know all these guys. But they never did anything because I don't want their money. I turned the money down. I turned down so much money, I feel like such a stupid person. No, it's true. First time in my life, I feel stupid. Guys are giving me, offering me millions. Don, I'd like to give you a million. One guy, I'm telling you, $5 million. I could have it right now, and I turn him down. I go back, I say, do you think I'm doing the right thing? In fact, how about, I'll just take a vote. How about if I take all this money and promise, I swear to you, that I won't do anything for these people? What about that? No? That's what I thought. I feel so stupid, but you know what? That's the way it has to be. Because I think one of the things they like about me is they're not gonna, nobody's going to buy me. Nobody's going to buy me. And all right, so after about 10 minutes, 
Bush goes out and he says, all right, you can build your plant, build it. I'm sorry, please, how dare me? I mean, it was so terrible that I even thought about doing that, you know, because you contributed money. Okay, me different. I'll call him up and say, gotta go. I don't want you in Mexico. I love Mexico, I love the Mexican people. I have thousands of Mexican people that have worked for me over the years. And even to this day, I mean, I love the Hispanics. The spirit, I love them. They're incredible people. But we have leaders that can't compete with their leaders. Their leaders are too smart. So I would say to the head of Ford, sorry, I'm not going to approve. You're going to pay a tax. Where every car and every truck and every part that comes across that southern border, you're going to pay a 35% tax, okay? That's what's going to happen. And this is too easy. I don't need any of the killers that I told you. I'm, I'm going to get use them anyway. But this is too easy. This is like, like, forget it. This is this is taking candy from like that beautiful little baby. Okay, so easy. So what happens is they're going to say no, 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 and they're going to have people call me. But these are people that, that they I didn't take any money. I didn't take anything. I don't want their money. So they're going to have people call me, and I'm going to say get out of here. And if I know them, they'll be friends of mine maybe. I'll say, I'm not interested. And I would say, let's say this whole process starts at 12 noon. I would say by 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the head of Ford will call me and say, Mr. President, we've decided to build in the United States. That will happen. Okay? That will happen. If they're really tough, they'll wait till the next day. But I guarantee you, by 5 o'clock the next day, that deal, they're back. And that's great. That's what we need. We need jobs. We can't keep giving out our jobs. You know, college debt, I go all over now. And I see the vets are mistreated in this country so badly. So bad, oh, believe me. You know, they did a poll. I'm like the most popular person with the vets. You know, I built the Vietnam Memorial in downtown Manhattan, okay? And the vets like me a lot. And they did a poll, and people were shocked. They said, why would you be shocked? Because I'm going to take care of the vets. The other one, college, college debt. It's out of control. And I go around, and I see students. And by the way, you see what's happening with the colleges? I mean, you talk about, like, what they're doing, the prices that, of these colleges, the way they're rapidly raising. And students are borrowing money from different people, but also from the government. It's the only thing that the government makes money on, college students. No, it's true. They're making a lot of money on college debt. And the big thing we need is jobs. And the students come up to me and they say, Mr. Trump, I'm borrowed. I can't, I can't even, I don't know how I'll ever pay it off. This is somebody that's a junior or a senior in college. And they, they, it's almost like they have no hope. It, to me, it's one of the saddest things I've seen in making the rounds, is college students, college debt. And they say, and then I apply for jobs. One was telling me from a very good college, actually a college in Iowa where I was, Great college, actually. And they were saying, you know, I worked hard. I became a great student. I forced my, I just became one of the top students in my class. I can't get a job, Mr. Trump. And a lot of them can't get jobs. So now they have the debt and they can't get jobs because China has our jobs and Japan has our jobs and so many other places have our jobs. We don't have jobs. So they get out and there's no place to go. And they don't know what to do. And we're going to solve the problem, because we're going to bring back the jobs from China, and we're going to bring back the jobs from Japan. <laughs> and we're going to be fair. But if you look at the deficit, the trade deficit that we have with China, it's astronomical. People are saying, how are you going to balance the budget? How about, like, making some good deals with China and Japan? Look at the trade deficit. I was in Los Angeles two weeks ago. I saw ships that were so big, I've never seen anything like it, with cars from Japan. They're pouring off. We sell them, and actually, you sell them some beef, right? Okay? This is one of the beneficiaries, beef. But honestly, if you have a look at the difference, numbers here, compare, it's, so, it's so crazy. We send wheat. They send cars. We send wheat. It's all going to change. And we're going to have great relationships with these people. You know the amazing thing? Every country in the world thinks that the United States is represented by stupid people. And they're right, of course. Very, no, they're wrong. Very stupid people. <laughs> and every country in the world, 
I mean, every country in the world, they, everybody makes money. And the funny thing is we don't get along with anybody. Think of it. Here we have, here we have deals that are all bad, and everybody hates us. I just came in, and I'm watching on television that we're really in a very bad place with Russia. Now, we're working on the Ukraine, and I think that's fine, but why isn't Europe sort of like leading that whole charge? Why are we always leading? We're working on the Ukraine. I think it's terrible, all that stuff. But we got a lot of problems. We're sending an F-22, brand new, gorgeous. And we, we have fighters. Our best military people are going over there. And we're worried about the Ukraine. I think Ukraine's great. I think it's, we should worry about the Ukraine. But you know, Germany is over there. Germany is far richer than we are. Germany's made a fortune. We protect Germany for no money. Okay? We protect South Korea for no money. So Germany is over there, right? And they're, they're not worried about it. But Obama's talking about the Ukraine, the Ukraine. Germany's sitting around, let, the, let these dopey people take care of us. And, and all the European countries. So we're sending our fighters. Now, in North Korea, you have a situation where, you know, he's rearing his head again. I just ordered 4,000 television sets for a big job that I did. And 4,000, that's a lot of sets. They're all made in South Korea. They don't make them in Iowa. I wish. Did anybody make television sets? You make television sets? Huh? They don't make them in Iowa. They don't make them anywhere in this country. So I ordered 4,000. Samsung, it's LG. It's all of them, right? All of them. They're all from South Korea. Sony's from Japan. Their sets aren't as good anymore, but that's okay. They're good, they're good sets. They're great. I paid a fortune. And I'm saying, they make a fortune. Look at the deficit that we have with South Korea. I love South Korea. I love all these countries. But why is it that we protect them? So this guy raises his head, nuclear, this, I'm going to wipe them out. We immediately sent, we have 28,000 troops over there right now, which is nothing compared to the million that they have in North Korea, big army. Okay, they don't pay us anything. What are we doing? And you know what? Somebody said, that's not nice. You're asking them to pay. How can we police? We're watching the Ukraine. We're watching South Korea. We're watching Germany. We're watching Japan. We protect Japan. We have a treaty with Japan. If Japan gets attacked, we have to immediately go to their aid, okay? If we get attacked, Japan doesn't have to help us. So that's a fair deal. That's the kind of deals we make. No, no, that's the kind of deals we make. They have nothing to do. Oh, they got attacked. Don't worry about it. But if they get attacked, we have to go over to Japan. Oh, yeah, yeah, you have a fly off the long flight. So, so we need smart people. And we can straighten this country out. We can make this country so strong. We can make it better than ever, in my opinion. We can make it better than ever. Saudi Arabia. I love Saudi Arabia. The people are very nice to me. They buy my apartments. You wouldn't believe it. It's true. They'll pay me anything. They have nothing but money. They have nothing but money. I have a beautiful plane. All of a sudden, it doesn't look so good when I look at some of their planes. I'm jealous. It's terrible. I'm jealous. No, but Saudi Arabia, they make a billion dollars a day. Now, in all fairness, that was before the you know, oil went down. But now, let's say it's a half a billion. OK, that's pretty good. You make a half a billion a day. It's pretty good. We protect them. We protect Saudi Arabia. We get nothing. And every time, if you think in Yemen, those folks are after Yemen, then you ought to leave the room right now because you're not very smart. Yemen, did you ever see the border? It never ends. It's a straight line. It never ends. And you know what's on the other side? Saudi Arabia, the oil. If you think they're stopping at Yemen, they're looking for the oil. Don't forget, I'm the one. I'm the most militaristic person. I would build a military so strong, so powerful, so incredible, nobody would ever use it. <laughs> nobody would ever have, we would never have to use it. I would have the best everything. You know, we have a military where we give to the allies, our allies. We're giving to the wrong allies, by the way. You know that. We're giving to the wrong allies. We don't give to the Kurds. We give to people. One bullet shot in the air. 2,300 Humvees, armor-plated, the best in the world. So I heard they left, and one day they abandoned 2,300. I said, no, no, no. You mean 23. You mean three. You mean two. Can't leave 2,300. 
They abandoned 2,300 armor-plated, the best in the world, Tom V's. 2,300. Because one shot was fired in the air. These are the people we're helping. These are the people we're helping. And now the enemy has the Humvees armor-plated, and we have the ones where they're not armor-plated, and our wounded warriors, who are the greatest people we have in this country, they're the greatest. The greatest. And our soldiers aren't protected. And the enemy is because they have these great vehicles that they took. And that's just the Humvees. You could go into everything. They have the best equipment we have. So we have to get smart. And we have to know what we're doing. And I would build, I'm telling you, I am so into it. But in 2000, and Ann Coulter knows this, in 2004, as much as I am into the military, which I love and respect, I'm a huge fan of General Patton. I'm a huge fan of General Douglas MacArthur. To this day, he has the highest marks. I'm a, I'm a person I believe in, like, marks and students and, like, education. I think it's great. General Douglas MacArthur, to this day, has the highest grades in the history of West Point. That means something. You know, it means something, right? It's nice. It's a nice thing. And we have to do something, and we have to do it Fast. We have to get the generals that are great. There was a general, I won't use his name, but he's leaving. And they said to him the other day about ISIS on television, well, what do you think about ISIS? Can we beat them? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's going to be very hard, very hard to beat ISIS. And I said to myself, can you imagine George Patton saying, oh, it'd be hard to be. He'd have them knocked out in about three days, and he'd say, where's the next country? Where, where do I go from here? Where? Where? <laughs> General Douglas MacArthur getting out with his corn cob pipe right out of the airplane, looking over the land that he just took. Can you imagine him? First of all, they wouldn't go on television. They're too busy fighting. They want to win. They're too busy winning. We don't have winners anymore. We don't have winners in this country. But we're going to turn that around. We're going to have winners. Now, speaking of winners, this is so important. We all know about trade. We've covered it. It's horrendous. I'm going to get the greatest negotiators in the world. We're going to make great trades. We're going to make a lot of money. We're going to be great. Everyone's going to love us, okay? We have, they're going to love us. True. You know, funny, before, in Business Week magazine, again, they had a story a while ago. The 10 things the Chinese most want. Now, who's tougher in the Chinese than me? And I, I love them, I have respect for them. I just hate what they do to our leaders. But who's tougher than me? The 10 things, one of the 10 things was anything Trump. Apartments, anything, anything Trump. We want anything Trump. I say, how could that be possible? Because maybe they respect me. Or maybe they respect us. I don't know. But anything Trump. Okay. So we're going to be respected. We're going to be really respected. We shouldn't have gone to Iraq. And we did. We made a mistake. When we went out, we should have kept the oil, and you wouldn't have ISIS, believe me. You wouldn't have it. Now people say, oh, that's such a harsh statement. He said, take the oil. Who the hell has the oil? The Iraqi government is totally corrupt. ISIS is uh, it just formed out of Iraq. So we shouldn't have gone in, and then the way Obama got out was a total catastrophe. And then I said, total catastrophe. <laughs> and I said... Reuters, 2004, July. I said, don't go in, because if you do that to Iraq, and I'm one that wants to be, like, I love, I love the strength of military. You gotta use it in the right location. If you do that, you're going to allow Iran to take over, because you're gonna decapitate, they were two powers that were equal. They'd fight, they'd go 10 feet, 10 feet, 10 feet, then they rest. This goes on for decades. They go 10, 10, right? Am I right? So we decapitate one of them. Now Iran is, as we speak, meeting with Iraq to take over the country. And you know who's getting the oil, most of the oil? The stuff that ISIS doesn't have? China. You know that China is getting so much oil out of it. We're getting, you know, we get nothing. Thousands of lives, wounded warriors who I love all over, Two trillion dollars, we have nothing. In 
Afghanistan, which a lot of people don't know, is very rich in minerals, not oil, in minerals. We're fighting in Afghanistan, and they have very amazing mountains and ridges. We're fighting in Afghanistan over here. And on the other side of the mountain, they have massive excavation equipment from China. They're taking out all the minerals as we fight. We need people that are smart. We have people that don't get it. Look at the deal we have with Iran. Look at this deal. It is going to, in my opinion, lead to an arms race, the likes of which there has never been. Countries are going to line up for nukes. You're going to have, perhaps, nuclear proliferation. You're going to see things that you have never seen take place in a short period of time. This is a deal that just the other day, it was determined after months. You ever see a deal take so long, too, by the way? The deal's been going on forever. They had our prisoners. We never asked for our prisoners. How about that? Little, you know, look, having a deal is good. But we should have doubled and tripled up the sanctions and negotiated from strength. We could have done it so easily. Instead, we have Kerry that goes on bicycle races. He's in a bicycle race. He's 73 years old. 73 years old. And I said it the last time I spoke. I swear to you, I will never enter a bicycle race if I'm president. I swear. I swear. He, he's in a bicycle race. He falls, he breaks his leg. This is our chief negotiator. He's walking in. They're looking at him like, what a schmuck. This is. I watched, actually, on Charlie Rose, I watched the chief negotiator being interviewed by Charlie. And after five minutes, I tweeted, at real Donald Trump, I tweeted. I said, this guy is too smart for Kerry. I was right. So we have, we didn't get the prisoners. And you know what the excuse was? We didn't ask for them. We didn't want to make the deal too complicated. Think of it. They're fighting us in Yemen. We didn't ask anything about Yemen. Like, don't fight us. We have a 24-day wait period. So if we think they're doing nuclear, we have to wait 24 days. But see, that's not the worst part. The worst part is the clock doesn't start ticking. Could be months. We have to notify them. There's a whole process. I mean, they could build, shoot, and build a couple of more shoot. And by that time, we still wouldn't be in there checking. In fact, I can just see them sweeping up the floor, painting it battleship gray. You know, when I was with my father in Brooklyn, I used to paint garages battleship gray. I'd always like that. Do you, you know what I mean by battleship gray? Shiny battleship gray. I can just see him doing it. So what we're doing is crazy. So you have that. And then the beauty of all, and you heard it two days ago, after years, we just found out that they're going to do in the most important section, they're going to do their own inspections. Did you hear this? Iran is going to do their own inspections. Did you hear about this one? Look, some of these guys didn't hear. Where the hell have you been for the last three days? Look at these guys. They're smart guys. Three days ago, I heard it. Nobody knew. They are going to self-inspect. It is so unbelievable that it, it, you just can't even talk about it. And here's another part. We're going to give them $150 billion plus. And even if the deal isn't approved, they get that. In other words, they get that regardless. You know, when I do a deal, when I buy something, I pay them when I buy the product, right? Whatever the hell it is. I buy a building. I buy this. I pay them. I put up a deposit and, right? And I pay them when the deal closes. We're paying them even if a deal doesn't happen. I've never heard of this one before. I don't know who came up with the idea. It must have been Kerry. No, it must have been. Because I don't think the Iranians, you know, the Iranians, Persians are great negotiators. They're natural great negotiators. I don't believe they would have even thought of this because it's so crazy. No, it's true. They wouldn't have actually said, let's do this, because it's so far out. Who would ever think of it? They get $150 billion plus plus, even if the deal's voted down and if the deal doesn't happen, which the deal will probably happen, because we have a lot of weak people that are going to approve that deal, just like they approved Obamacare. You know, you elected people that were going to knock out Obamacare. They got to Washington. Something happened. I promise it's not going to happen to me. Something happens in Washington. They get elected. They're really going to do a job. They're all enthused. We're going to end Obamacare. We're going to fight. We're going to end this horrible thing with the $5 billion website. That doesn't work to this day, by the way. 
Five billion. I have about 40 websites. I, they cost me three dollars. And they work. So, so we're going to end Obamacare. Paula, you probably elected some of them. And they go to Washington. I don't know. There's something about Washington. They look at these beautiful buildings, these beautiful halls, and all of a sudden, they become impotent. Is that an appropriate word? I think so. They become just, it doesn't work. Put those two together. Something happens to them. And all of a sudden, they're not fighters. I think they're so impressed. They show their wives. They show their husbands. Look where I'm working. I'm working in Congress. Of course, I've got to vote for Obamacare. Isn't it wonderful? Look what I'm doing. But they got elected to knock it out. What happened to these people? What happened? So something happens when people get elected and go to Washington. The beauty of Washington. I'm building, as you know, the old post office. I, bought, I got. Can you imagine President Obama is in charge of government services, who are tremendous people, by the way. They really are. They're very talented people. But that's because they chose me. If they didn't choose me, I probably wouldn't be sitting there. But they are talented people. They're great people. And we're doing a great hotel, one of the greatest hotels. I think it'll be one of the greatest hotels anywhere in the world. But think of it. Everybody wanted it. One of the most sought-after pieces of property, right smack on Pennsylvania between Congress and the White House. Best location. You know, for the real estate people, they know this. Any time you get a post office, it's good. You know, the post office was always there first. They always have the best. I have the old post office in Washington, D.C. So it's being converted to Trump International Hotel. It's going to be great. And just think of that. I got it from the Obama administration. I can't even, to this day, I say, are you sure we got that? Let's tell you. But we're doing a great job. And here's the thing. We're ahead of, think of this. Compare this to government. We're way ahead of schedule, and we're under budget. Did you ever hear that before? You don't hear that stuff. So, so we have a great country. We have a country with tremendous potential. The potential is here. The people are the potential. We have great people. We have problems all over the place. But they're problems that can be solved. We have to incentivize people. We have to give people spirit. When President Obama was elected, one thing I thought would happen, I really thought he would be a unifier. You look at Baltimore, you look at Ferguson, you look at St. Louis the other night, you look at Chicago, you look at so many different places. And you look at what's happening with the African-American youth. It's never been in worse shape, never. You look at what's happening with so many other aspects of our country, and there's a racial divide, there's a divide, period. There's hatred all over the country. I've never seen it like this. We have to unify the country. We have to spiritize the country. We have to create jobs. We have to do a tremendous amount of work. But it can be done quickly. I will say this. If the right person is not elected come next year, I don't know if it can be brought back again, no matter how competent or capable the person is. It's going to be too far down the line. No, it's going to be too far down the line. So, just in closing, and you know, normally I do questions, but this has been such a good time, and everyone's had to hit, heard such a brilliant speech, you know. You know, I was with Elton John. Elton John's a Do Anybody like Elton John? I like Elton John. And a lot of times, like, they'll do this last song, and it's so great. It's so unbelievable. The place is standing and roaring and going incredible. And then they'll be like, they'll come back for like three more, right? And the three aren't as good as the last one. And people go, good, let's get out of here, Alice. Well, <laughs> so, you know, you like to leave on a high note. And I just like this audience. This is a great audience. But I have a, thank you. I love you too. Thank you. But, but you know, I have, a statement, I say it all the time, and I told the story once before, and it's that the American dream is dead, but I'm going to make it bigger and better and stronger than ever before, right? Right? Good. But 
But I got home one night, and my wife said, oh, that was such a terrible thing you said. It was all over television. And the problem I have with television, look, they're all live. What do I do? Every night, I'm, there, I'm on live television. I'm supposed to make speeches. How do you make the same speech? I try and change it up. But every night, CNN, Fox, MS, NBC, everybody. Look at them. They're all live. It's not fair. No, no. These other guys, they go around, they make a speech in front of 21 people. Nobody cares. They can make the same. They read the same speech. They, de, 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 de. they have teleprompters. I say we should outlaw teleprompters for anybody, right? For anybody, for anybody running for president. You should be, you know how easy that would be? Instead of this, I'm working my ass off, okay? Instead of this, I could just stand up. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It's wonderful to be in Iowa. You know, everybody's gonna fall asleep and half an hour we leave, no mistakes, no problems. But I walk in, but they're always live, these guys. Ugh. I think we're gonna, can let's start canceling them a little bit. This is getting, and by the way, they're getting phenomenal ratings. That's why they're live. They're getting phenomenal ratings. And you know, in the old days, when I was with The Apprentice, they paid me a lot of money. They don't pay me anything. <laughs> you know, for the debate, we had 24 million people. Now, normally they have like 2 million people, right? When you say, and 2 million if they're lucky. They had 24, I won't take credit for it, but believe me, 100% it's me, 100%. It's true, it's true. So the ratings came out, they were so big and so, it was the biggest rating in the history of cable television or something like that. And you know, I was a little abused, but that's okay, I'm used to it. So what happens, I'm saying to myself, well, if it's not me, they have to, so, I should go to CNN, they're doing the next debate. And I should say to Jeff Zucker, a great guy, Jeff, I'm gonna do the debate, but I want $10 million for charity. American Cancer Society, AIDS Research, we'll pick 10 great, a million. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm not going to the debate. And honestly, I think they'd pay me. <laughs> I do, I'm all for sure, 100% for charity. But it might not look right. I don't know, Ann. I, I'm going to have to think about it. I sort of like that. Does anybody like that idea? I think they're going to do it. <laughs> then we go to Roger Ailes, who's a great guy at Fox. And we say, Roger, you know, they did so great at CNN. You did so great at Fox. Let's make it like 12, 15, 18, all for charity. But I'm thinking about it. I am thinking about it, believe me. So I go home, though. My wife says to me, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing? It was a horrible thing you said. And I said, why? What did I say? You said the American dream is dead. I said, I didn't say that. And I turn on the television, TiVo's wonderful. And I turn it on, and they have it cut. It's the American dream is dead, cut. I said, what a terrible statement. But what I do say, and I say it all the time, the American dream is, to a large extent, it's in trouble. But we're going to make it bigger and better and stronger than ever before, and <laughs> And we are going to win the nomination, and we are going to get the greatest people that have ever represented. We're going to get the smartest, toughest, best people to represent us against the world. And we are going to make our country so great again. You're going to be so proud of it. And it's an honor to be with you tonight, and I really look forward to being with you for many, many years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.